one touch from the master will bake your whole again. All you need is just one touch, one healing touch, just one touch of his love. Hello, praise the Lord, and welcome to Healing Touch. I am your host, Dr. Gina Miller, and today our topic of discussion is prayer time. And we just want to talk briefly with you about prayer. Prayer is having a conversation with God, just as simple as that, having a conversation with God. And so we want to just talk about prayer in the simplest way that we can in order to help you to come to a place where you feel comfortable praying to God. Amen. So the first thing I wanted to do was to look in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we want to look at different times when there were prayer meetings. Uh, the first prayer meeting we're going to look at is the prayer meeting in the upper room and that's in the book of Acts in the first chapter and Acts chapter 1 beginning at verse 13 we see here it says that and when they were come in they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew Philip and Thomas Bartholomew and Matthew James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now, remember what I said in the beginning, that prayer is basically a conversation with God. So all these people were in one place, and that place was called the upper room, and they were having a conversation with God. They were praying. So in the upper room and the subject that we listen or hear about most was how that in the upper room, in the book of Acts, the Bible speaks about when the Holy Ghost fell on all of the people that were in the room. And the whole reason why they came to this place called the upper room together was in anticipation or waiting for the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus promised them that if they, if he had to go away, that he would come back again, but he wouldn't leave them comfortless. He wouldn't leave the world without a comforter, although he had to leave he would send the comforter and another name for the comforter is the Holy Ghost. So they were in the upper room praying and waiting for the anticipation of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And in Acts 2 in chapter 1, the Bible says that, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, that upper room, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they received the answer to their prayer, that anticipation of the Holy Spirit that they began to pray for when they first entered the upper room was finally manifested when we read about it in Acts chapter 2. Now, another um, place where we see prayer is in Acts chapter 12, prayer meeting. And this prayer meeting is in a house. Acts chapter 12, starting at verse 5. That's Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 5. I hope you're following with me in your Bible, because this is a Bible study. This is a time for you to study just as well 
as I'm studying and we're reading and, and searching through the scriptures, this is a time that you can search the scriptures for yourself and see what they say for yourself. So Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and the light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Wow. So now that's a remarkable, remarkable miracle. Peter was miraculously released from his chains. And it says here that prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So the church was praying with nonstop to God, had a conversation with God for Peter because he was in prison. And the angel said unto him, gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. So he told him to get up, put on your shoes, put your clothes on and follow me. And he went out and followed him and winced not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought that he saw a vision. So Peter got up and did what the angel told him, but he didn't believe that it was true. What was happening? Because he thought it was a vision. He, he didn't couldn't believe that this was happening to him. When they were past the first and the second ward, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city which opened to them of his, of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through the street, one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. So when they got past the second ward, it's basically it's like they went past, you know, a second block, and then they got to the gate, and the gate opened up by itself, and then they went out and passed on through one street, and the angel was gone. The angel disappeared. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying, having a conversation with God to God for a certain thing. They were all gathered together in the house praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. A damsel, a, a young lady, came to answer the door and her name was named Rhoda, right? Now mind you, I told you this was in a house. These people were in one place on one accord praying unto God, as we read in the beginning, right? In verse 5 on Acts chapter 12, it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. They were in the house and they were praying without stopping for Peter. So now here comes Peter after his chains were, were loose off his hands and the angel came unto him, told him to get up, put on your sandals, put on your shoes, put on your clothes, follow me. Followed him out the prison. The gates of the prison were open and he went and, and walked out to the street. The angel disappeared. Peter kept on walking, couldn't believe that what was happening, thought he was in a vision, couldn't believe that he was just let go and set free from prison and that this angel had led him through the way, right? And so now here he comes, he appears at the door, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda, verse 13, now verse 14, and when she knew, when she knew that Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. She heard Peter through the door, and she was so excited, 
She didn't even open a door, right? But ran back in the house. She ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So she went back to the house, inside the house, and she told the people, Peter's at the door. Peter's at the gate, right? And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were amazed. Now, let's back up. They were all in the house. They were all, it says, on one accord, praying to God for Peter. Now, when we pray, we should pray with an expectation and anticipation that we will, will receive what we are praying for. Just as in um, Acts chapter 1 when we read that those that were in the upper room were praying in anticipation, in expectation of receiving the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And then in Acts chapter 2 we see where they did receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost or the Comforter did come in answer to their anticipated prayer their expectation that God would answer their prayer. Now here we have an example in Acts chapter 12 where Peter is in prison. The church are in a certain place in the house and they're all praying, expecting that God would um, deliver Peter and they are praying for him. And of course, I'm sure they're praying that God would deliver Peter from the prison. So now here Peter is he is delivered. He is set free from the prison. An angel comes and sets him free, delivers him out of the prison. He appears at the house. He's knocking on the door. The, the um, young lady answers. She hears Peter's voice, runs back in the house, tells everybody Peter's at the door, and they don't believe that Peter's at the door. We have to be careful that when we begin to pray and ask God for for deliverance and pray to God, speaking to God and saying to God, this is my situation, this is what's going on, this is what I'm going through. I need your help, God, I need your divine intervention in this situation. I'm praying and I'm asking you for your deliverance. I need your help, I can't do it by myself. And we submit ourselves to him and, and pray that he will intervene in that situation. We have to be careful that we don't get into doubt and, and, and unbelief and cancel out our own faith because we begin to disbelieve that God will do what we're asking him to do. If you didn't believe that God would answer your prayer, then why are you praying? We have to remember that we have to hold on to our faith. Hold on. Hold on tight to what you believe in. The reason why we pray to God is because we believe that he is God and that he will bring whatever it is that is his will in our life. He will bring it to pass in our life. So don't let go of your faith. Don't let go of your hope and your trust in God, because that is what you have to hold on to, to continue to believe that God will answer your prayer. So as Peter began to stand here at the gate, at the door, he's knocking. The, the young lady hears him, goes back, tells them that Peter's at the gate. And then they come back to her and say, look, man, lady, basically they told her, you're mad. You must be crazy, you know. So and they said unto her, thou art mad. Verse 15, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel more doubt. Now you're saying that basically he's, you know, he, he's um, dead and now here's his angel. Where are they getting that from? That's not even scriptural, you know. So, so here we go with the doubt and the unbelief, you know, and, and just making stuff uh, up to uh, appease our own mindset, to appease our own fear, basically. But we have to hold on steadfast to the hope and the faith and the trust that we have in God and believe his word. Amen. So in verse 16, the Bible says, but Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, 
they were astonished. They were amazed when they opened the door and saw Peter standing there. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go, show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there he abode. So Peter, when he proved to, to, to the people in the house that it was in fact himself, he told them, look, be quiet, because they're still astonished, right? He said, be quiet, let me just tell you. He said, please, I want to hold your peace. Be quiet. I want to tell you how that the Lord brought me out of the prison. I want to show you. I want to tell you. I wanted to testify to you how that the Lord brought me out of the prison. And he told them what things that the angel had did. And he said, now I want you to go show these things unto James. Tell James all about this and the rest of the brethren. And then he went and went into a departed from there and went into another place because his work was not finished, of course, especially after an experience like that. I'm sure he got more boldness. He got more uh, faith and, and more hope and trust in God to continue on the journey that God had for his life. So now here, another example is by a river where there's prayer meeting. In Acts chapter 16, in verse 13, again, remember the topic of our discussion is prayer time. These are different examples of places where prayer had taken place. OK, so I want you to remember that as you continue in this study. Acts chapter 16. Now, looking at verse 13, we see here whereby a river prayer is taking place. Right. Acts chapter 16 and verse 13. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, right? Where prayer was a custom. Want, the word here in the King James Version is W-O-N-T, but basically what it means is to be accustomed to, like it, it would happen, right? So it was known to happen. Where prayer was known to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither or there, right? So on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was accustomed to be made. And we sat down and we spake unto the women which resorted there. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us, right? Or she convinced, convinced them to stay in her house because Lydia was converted. Lydia was one who was used um, very... Um, very frequently by those who were in the, in the city and they were basically extorting money from people and using her. But Lydia got converted when Paul testified unto her and Paul helped her to see that she could be set free and she could be delivered from what she was bound by because she was bound by these men. And God delivered her. And so because Lydia was so grateful to God for the deliverance that she received, she asked them to come and to abide in her home. And they did so. They were con con convinced by her to go and to be with her and her household, her whole family. Now let's go and look at what God did for Lydia because you have to understand that if God could do it for Lydia whatever what he did for Lydia he could do for you 
Amen. And she was a European woman. So if we look in Acts uh, chapter 16, 14 and 15 and verse 40. And we read 14 and 15. Now here's 40. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and they departed. So we see here that Lydia is now become a staple that she has become one that actually supported the um, Paul and, and the rest of the disciples in the ministry. Amen. And that's an important thing to take note of, that once you are delivered and once God answers the prayer of someone who has been bound by witchcraft, bound by sin, bound by sorcery and whatever it is that God has delivered you from, you have an overwhelming um, gratitude to the point where you want to do whatever it is in your power and outside of your power to express that gratitude. And that's what Lydia is doing. She's basically sharing with her family the good news of the gospel that God has delivered her, that belief and faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ has set her free. So when she sees these men of God, she sees them that they are continuing in the faith and continuing in the spreading of the gospel and the good news of salvation in Jesus' name. She wants to be helpful and supportive of that work so that someone else would receive the same gift of salvation that she has received. Amen. Because he did it for her, he could do it for you. He did it before, he'll do it again. And that's the, the gift that we need to not be stingy in sharing. Amen? We, we need to, to give it freely. This testimony, this witness of what God has done for us needs to be shared at all times whenever possible. That somebody else would say, well, he did it for her, he did it for him, he can do it for me. God is no respecter of persons. In other words, he doesn't have any favorites. He doesn't pick this one today and that one tomorrow and, and say, oh no, well those over there, we're not going to be concerned about you know, their healing or not be concerned about their salvation. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So just as the Bible says in the book of Romans in chapter 10, verse 9, and Romans 9 and 10, that God is not, it's not his will that any should perish, right? But that all should have everlasting life is what we, we learned in John 3, 16. I mean, some of us have learned that many, many years ago in Sunday school. And for some of us, this might be the first time you're hearing it, but don't forget it. John 3, 16, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe on him, believe on his son, they would not perish but have everlasting life. And then in 17, he says, because he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. Amen. So in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Just have a little conversation with God. Just have a talk with God. That's all you have to do is pray, have a little conversation with God, Believe that the Lord has sent, that God has sent his son to die for your sins, as we read in John 3, 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth of the Lord, the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. For the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That's in verse 11. Whoever believe on the Lord 
shall not be ashamed. Now, the next place that we want to talk about a prayer meeting or prayer taking place is on a beach. On a beach. Acts 21 and verse 5. That's got to be a really, really nice, beautiful place to pray. Amen. To have a conversation with God is on the beach. Acts 21, chapter 5. And the Bible says, And when, when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. This is when Paul was in Tyra. Paul is warned about Jerusalem. I want to start from actually the first verse of Acts chapter 21 and read down to verse 6. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Kuls, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. So Paul is on his journey, his missionary journey, one of his missionary journeys, and he's talking about the, the travels and, and the different places that he stopped at. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and we set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyra, for there the ship was to unload her burden. The ship was supposed to unload the burden at Tyra. So they stopped at Tyra. And finding the, the disciples, we tarried there for seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. So the disciples told him in Tyra, don't go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and we prayed. Amen. So because of the conversation with God, because they prayed, God sent word to Paul that he should not go into Jerusalem through the disciples. And this is the accomplishment of prayer that having a conversation with God, submitting yourself to hear what God has to say and committing your way to his will, God will give you direction about what to do with your life. So I wanted to, con to encourage you to continue to pray, continue to search the scriptures and be blessed because you have been watching Healing Touch where on Healing Touch, you have found that just one touch from the master will make you whole again. We have to cut off here, but I want you to continue to study and remember that God loves you and he's concerned about you. You have been watching Healing Touch. from the master will make you whole again all you need is just one touch one healing touch just one touch of his love though you've been hurt before your heart has been broken was torn in two. I know someone who cares. He's knocking at your door, waiting to come in. Just one touch, one healing touch, one touch from the master will make you whole again. All you need is just one touch, one healing touch, just one touch. Just one touch, 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 just one touch.